Okay, looks like most people are here. Um, just had a couple of quick announcements before we get started. The first one is, as those of you who are in my virology course know, and I see a couple of those faces here, one of the things I'm doing, as opposed to my 18 other full-time jobs, is I'm trying to make a movie about viruses in general and how viruses are actually good for us as opposed to viruses being bad for us. Viruses have a really bad rap as far as I'm concerned. You can hear way more about this in the, my virology class that I'll be teaching next term. But uh, the filmmaker may be coming by and is going to check out this room and see if it's going to work for actually doing some filming. If that actually does take place, I will certainly let you guys know about that. He also said, please make sure to get them all to like us on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> so it is an edge of life movie. And if I get to it at the end of today's lectures, um, I've got a link there. Um, as you'll see, and if you want to start right now, you can get your clickers out because I have clicker questions. They are not going to count today, so you don't actually really have to get them out. Um, but this is just to give you a bit of an idea what kind of clicker questions I'm going to ask, etc., cetera, um, and get you used to that kind of thing. That being said, I will, of course, post these lectures with those questions on D2L. Afterwards, I didn't put them up already. Otherwise, you would know all the answers already. Yeah. Were you normally posting slides before? Yes, I did. It was about 10:30 last night that they were posted. So um, it's we're switching textbooks, as I'm sure far too many of you know, um, and that means it's a lot more prep time for me to put the lectures together. So, but I try and get them up by 10 o'clock the night before. Again, sometimes it ends up being a little bit later than that. So, but they are posted. People get them, found them. Yes. Good, some of you, not all of you, shaking heads. OK, so that's why we need the clickers so people can actually go. Question, yes? So when you um, register for uh, an eye filter, do you use your um, number or do you use your name? Because I know you use your PSU number. Either one should work. Um, I would use your PSU number. That's a definitely it's a more definitive identifier. But I can use both. It's not a problem. <laughs> Other questions, concerns, comments? There's one more announcement I wanted to make, and that is that we have our biology seminar series, which is every Thursday at noon. It's starting tomorrow. Forget who the seminar speaker is this week, but next week's seminar speaker, speaker is a fellow by the name of Michael Emmerman from the Hutch, Fred Hutcherson Cancer Research Center up in Seattle. He's going to be talking about HIV evolution and the evolution of humans regarding dealing with retroviruses, which we've clearly done for pretty much all of our evolution. So that's um, announcements. So let's get started, since I promised, with some clicker questions. Um, can you see in the back, is the lighting OK? Yep, good. OK, so um, really tough clicker question here. And actually, I need to start the clicker. That would help, so you can actually get some answers here. Um, what is your current student status? You're a junior in biology, a senior biology major, an other major, post back, or my favorite, None of the above. OK, any more people want to actually chime in on this one? Otherwise, we'll. Uh, We'll stop and we'll move to the next one. So our next question, much more appropriate, if we can actually get it to move now. Blank contain the most molecular diversity. Microbes, animals, bacteria, plants, or amoeba. There's a timer up at the top now. I usually give you 90 seconds. One thing I should mention um, 
For the clicker questions, it's not just you. Feel free to talk to your neighbors about this. So if you, and you're welcome to keep changing your mind until the very end. So um, that's completely up to you. But nobody seems to be changing their mind. <laughs> Okay, we'll try this. Let's see. That stopped. Let's show our results, which are shown here. Uh, trying to still get used to this new system. My apologies about trying to take care of all of this. Here's a pointer here. Come back over to here. Uh, okay, it's still not showing me where I can move over to here. Um, so 45% of you liked microbes, which is what I like too. 7% uh, said animals, 45% said bacteria, and then we got a few small percentage of plants and um, amoeba. Uh, turns out amoeba have the largest genomes that we've talked about. And so in that particular organism, they've probably got a huge amount of diversity, but relatively speaking. Um, it's really the microbes. And the microbes here, and the reason that it's microbes versus bacteria is there's lots of other microbes other than bacteria, such as the archaea, microbial eukaryotes, et cetera. So that's the reasoning behind that. OK, next question. <clears throat> Let's start. What recent results of molecular biology are not accounted for by the central dogma? So the role of RNAs in A, the role of transcriptional regulation B, role of translation regulation C, the proteins make RNA, but RNA makes proteins D, the proteins have many different functions. Yes, again, feel free to talk to your neighbors. Okay, let's see if I can move these results over now. Yay, okay. So, <clears throat> now of course I can't see them anymore. 14% <laughs> think the role of RNAs, got a few percentages down B and C. Most people think that proteins make RNA, but RNA makes proteins. I actually like A better than I like D, which probably means it's a bad question, relatively to everything else. Uh, but the reasoning behind that is we've actually known for a very long time that proteins make RNA and RNA makes proteins. The ribosome has been known to be RNA for a really long time, that the RNA polymerase is protein has been known for a really long time. And again, this has nothing to do with the central dogma, which is DNA goes to RNA goes to protein. And the real central dogma says that it's proteins that are important for all of the actual functions inside the cell. And so Really, it's this role of RNAs, which is very new in terms of the understandings that we have of molecular biology and partly why we really need to throw out this textbook and get yet another textbook, unfortunately, which you guys have to deal with all the time. Pardon? The oh, but yeah, so again, this is sort of a, as a dichotomy and I mentioned this last time in lecture, that it's kind of bizarre that you need RNA to make proteins, but proteins to make RNA. It's kind of a chicken and egg problem. Well, again, it's the but or the and, which again, and that's probably why it's not a terribly good question. <laughs> I'm 
um, which is why I always normalize to the highest score on my exams, which usually ends up being about 40 out of 50, which means there are 10 bad questions in every exam. <laughs> which is nice because you get to decide which those 10 bad questions are because they're the ones that you missed. So they're your 10 bad questions, not my 10 bad questions. So it's actually to your advantage, even though people don't seem to usually think that. Okay, so let's move on. Um, we've already done some of this review already, which is partly why I have these clicker questions. It's partly review as well. Um, talked a little bit about the three domains. Again, bacteria, archaea, eukarya, all molecularly different from each other in details, but fundamentally really extremely similar to each other. And so that has to do with the fact that these are all made up of cells. Central dogma, we just went through. And then we talked a little bit about the various different molecules of life that we're going to spend a lot more time talking about for the rest of lecture today. Um, ATP, various nucleotides, proteins, sugars, and lipids. And then we talked a little bit about genomes. What we didn't get to were model organisms. And so I'm going to spend probably about five, ten minutes talking about that just to start with today. So model organisms, which is really kind of the last lecture. Uh, other thing is I will, I've updated the PowerPoints for the last lectures, the slides I slipped, the slides that I skipped, um, I will have now, I've taken out of that particular lecture. So I'll upgrade a new version of that lecture like I'm, I'm going to upload the version with the questions for this lecture as well. So then we'll move in and talk about chemistry, you know, all the chemistry you need to know for this course in three quarters of a lecture. Uh, starting out with bonds, just very general chemical properties. Hopefully, again, this should all be review. Somebody came up to me after lecture last time, said this stuff was all review for me. It should be, and today's lecture should be review as well. So yeah, we will get on the new stuff, I promise. Uh, cellular chemical components, again, this is mostly you know, pretty standard. Fortunately, there aren't terribly many atoms that we use in terms of biology. Look at chemical reactions, and these are particularly biochemical reactions. Again, really quite straightforward. And then talk a little bit about energetics. This is thermodynamics and kinetics, but at a very basic kind of level. Let's start out talking about some of these model organisms. Again, the idea of a model organism is that we've got some molecular aspects of biology that are very similar to each other and it doesn't matter what organism it is, so you pick an organism that's easy to work with or an organism that a whole bunch of other people have already worked with, which is probably just about as common. Uh, bacteria, lots and lots of people work with E. coli. We already looked at the E. coli genome last time. It's about 4 million base pairs, about 4,000 genes. Big reasons to work with E. coli. It's really easy to grow, and the genetics are great. So between those two, it makes it actually really nice. Um, archaea, being a very diverse group molecularly compared to other organisms, although it turns out, and we'll see as we move on through the course, that a lot of their molecular biology is really similar to eukaryotes. Um, the model organism here is probably Sulfalobus sulfatericus that I work with. Um, three megabase pairs in size, about 3,000 genes, so a thousand times smaller than the human haploid genome, for instance, but still a lot of very interesting similarities between the two. But if we really want to know about eukaryotes and being anthropocentric is normal, we care about ourselves, uh, we're interested in eukaryotes. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is sort of the E. coli of eukaryotes. It's really easy to grow. You've got great genetic tools that you can use with it. But it's still a yeast, which is great and wonderful for beer and bread. But if you're trying to understand consciousness, brain function, et cetera, it's not really a great model organism. If you're interested in cell biology, Center of elegance is a really wonderful model organism. Again, great genetics, easy to grow, but in the particular case of C. elegans, you can actually see all of the cells inside this organism. So it's a wonderful model for cell biology, but also for genetics and evolution. And again, as I mentioned last time, Dr. Estes in our department here in biology does a lot of work with this organism. Arabidopsis thaliana is the classic model plant. And probably the most important thing about Arabidopsis is that its genome is really small compared to a lot of other plant genomes. We mentioned before, some plant genomes are really massive, way bigger than the human genome. 
This one's much smaller. It's only about 142 million base pairs. Um, but it has a similar number of genes as we do, about 25,000. Um, Drosophila melanogaster, classic fruit fly. This is, again, probably more by accident than anything else that it turned out to be a wonderful model organism. Great genetics, easy to grow. Again, anyone in the Pacific Northwest, certainly me, I've got a wonderful Drosophila collection in my kitchen next to my compost. Um, so <clears throat> easy to grow these guys. Um, turns out, again, a really nice model system for understanding particularly things about development. So it's been really well studied in terms of development. And then finally, um, we are basically just big mice. Uh, Mus musculus is probably the best and most studied model system in terms of trying to understand humans. That being said, um, there's still a long way to go between a mouse and a human. And you hear this all the time in research trials. It works great in mice, but doesn't work terribly well in humans. So there are disadvantages to that as well. A couple quick pictures of these things. On the upper left, we have C. elegans. Again, really easy to visualize all the cells that are present in C. elegans. On the upper right-hand side, we have Saccharomyces cerevisiae. These are the yeast again, model eukaryote, Drosophila down here in the bottom, and then Arabidopsis thaliana here in the middle. Um, also here is shown Xenopus. Um, this is female, male, you know, much more important the females than males in this particular species. Um, really wonderful for studying development. There's not great genetics in Xenopus, and so that's one of the problems that there are some model organisms. Another way of looking at this, and this is from our textbook, some other model organisms. My favorites, of course, are the viruses here, bacteriophage T4 in particular. Real fundamentals of molecular biology, and we'll come back to viruses again and again as we move through, such as central dogma, DNA going to RNA going to proteins. What does that? DNA is the genetic material, etc. cetera. Uh, bacteria, really important for gene regulation studies, and we'll talk about gene regulation a little bit later on. Again, yeast is sort of the E. coli of eukaryotes, and C. elegans, again, for really cell biological approaches. So one of my good friends from graduate school told me, um, he used to work on Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that all of these other model organisms are just bigger. They're not higher organisms, they're just bigger model organisms. It's like the fruit fly, again, particularly for development. Zebrafish is, what do I call it, an emerging model system. It's a vertebrate as opposed to the invertebrates that you have in the fruit fly and the other model organisms that I talked about so far. Um, also as a transparent body, you can grow them really well. This organism as a model system was really pioneered down at the U of O. Um, so they've got a really wonderful system in terms of zebrafish and we're getting that established here at PSU as well in terms of model organisms. Mice, um, again, this really could kind of look like a human, just a small furry one. Uh, and then the plants, Arabidopsis um, thaliana. And this is an example of how good these small furry humans are in terms of model systems. Uh, this is a human disease due to a mutation in a receptor protein tyrosine kinase that gives an absolutely identical phenotype in mice and in humans. So um, that's is a nice example of these, these model organism systems. Any questions on model organisms before we get really, really small. Okay, good. So, oh, yeah. Hmm? Is a virus considered an organism? Uh, so the question is, is a virus considered an organism? Uh, that's something that we need to meet at the Rogue about over a couple of beers. <laughs> and then we can move on to whether it's alive or not. And that's another totally different story. But if you're interested, check out that movie I was telling you about. <laughs> because I discussed that. Um, there's also a website that's connected to that, again, that you can like, where um, we actually have quite a few discussions about those kinds of things. Yeah, if you want to get me going, get me on the viruses, again, and people in my virology class know. Okay, so uh, cellular life, and this is actually not true for viruses, um, is mostly composed of water. And as we'll see, basically the rest of this lecture is going to be pretty much all about the water. And 
a lot of people say without water there wouldn't be life, at least not life as we know it. So one of the things that NASA is looking for in terms of astrobiology, finding life places other than Earth, is really looking for water. And that has to do with the chemistry of water that we're going to spend a lot more time talking about. Other than water, in a typical, this is a bacterial cell, turns out eukaryotic cells actually have more water and less of these other chemicals. Of course, water is a chemical. You know, don't get me started on that. But most of these other chemicals in the cell are proteins, quite a lot of RNA, and then much less of some of these other things, the nucleic acids of DNA, polysaccharides, etc. But the vast majority of these other chemicals are going to be our proteins, and that's partly why you know, people always thought, oh, hey, it's all about the proteins um, for the central dogma point of view. Um, and then these RNAs were all well and good, but they're mostly ribosomes, and so we don't really have to care about them too much. Well, that's, as I mentioned before, not really that true. So, again, it's all about the water as far as biological molecules are concerned. And that's true for macromolecules and the smaller monomer molecules as well. Basically, we've got really three flavors of these molecules. They're either going to like water, hydrophilic, dissolve nicely, hydrophobic, not like water very much, and not liking water, since there's so much water, that means all your hydrophobic molecules are going to come together or hydrophobic parts of molecules are going to come together. And then amphipathic, which is both. Part of the molecule likes water, part of the molecule doesn't like water. And we'll see that a very large proportion of biological macromolecules, particularly the nucleic acids and the proteins, fall into this class of partly liking water and partly not liking water, per se. So that being said, really gross overview Going down a little bit further, a lot of the concepts of molecular biology, and particularly, we call this sort of molecular biochemistry, have to do with sort of the next four kinds of aspects of things I'm going to be talking about. First one is molecular complementarity, and that is that you have shapes of different molecules that fit together. And when I say fit together, that can be at a purely physical level, but also at a chemical level. And we'll talk about how those things actually work um, a little bit later on. Really importantly here is that these are usually lots of relatively weak interactions between the two things that are interacting with each other. And that's great because it allows a lot of flexibility. If you didn't have flexibility, we'd all be rocks. Um, so in terms of biology, that flexibility is really, really important. Another aspect, which again we've talked about before, but we'll look at a little bit more detail today and of course further on through the rest of the course, um, is that almost all biological macromolecules are made up of these small subunits. Again, we talked about the individual nucleotides, we talked about the individual amino acids. These then come together through a polymerization process, be replication in terms of DNA, transcription in terms of RNA, translation in terms of proteins, where you put all of these individual monomers together to make a polymer. Okay, how can you do that? Well, energetically, as we'll talk about at the end of the class today, or maybe on Friday, depending on how far we get, uh, very often these are now activated monomers. And this really has to do with basic thermodynamics, entropy usually is being maximized. Clearly, entropy is going the opposite direction when you go from monomers to polymers. So you have to have some way of deriving this reaction in an otherwise usually unfavorable direction. So why bother with monomers in the first place? Well, basically, they're easy to move around, they're easier to make individually, and probably most importantly, you can shuttle them in and out of various different compartments, be those cells or actually intracellular compartments. And so that's why we have all of these monomers. Chemical equilibrium, again, hopefully this is all review for everybody. If it isn't, it's probably not the right class for you to be in. Uh, this has to do with just relative amounts of products as we have here, reactants as they go together. 
Chemical equilibria have to do with the relative concentrations of either the reactants and the products. All chemical reactions are reversible. Um, even if I tell you something is practically irreversible, they're all reversible. You'll have a little bit over this side and a lot more over this side. And we'll talk about how that happens in just a second. What are these activated monomers? Well, we already talked about the classic activated monomer before. That's adenosine triphosphate, which stores energy in various covalent bonds that are attached to each other. And these particular ones, these are the phosphoranhydride bonds, classic ATP. We already talked about the beta and gamma phosphates. Beta phosphate next to the end, the gamma phosphate. If you cleave both of these bonds, you get about 14 kilocalories per mole. And as we'll see, that's actually not very much energy. Everyone talks about you know, high energy. That's why the high energy here is in quotes. You actually don't get that much energy um, from ATP. But it's really useful. Why do I say that it's really not that much energy? Because covalent bonds are much higher energy. They're from you know, 50 to 100 kilocalories per mole varies depending on the atoms that we're talking about, et cetera. As far as this course is concerned, the main thing here is that when we're looking at a covalent bond, it's shared electrons. Two atoms which are sharing electrons reasonably equally, and of course we'll see the differences in just a second, um, between each of those atoms. So in the case of <clears throat> here, methane, we've got carbon in the middle, four hydrogens around the outside, the electrons are being shared between those. And so these are relatively strong bonds, and again, much higher energy than those high energy bonds that we just talked about. Fortunately, as far as biology is concerned, we don't have to worry about most of the periodic table. We can shrink it down to basically these five individual atoms, and the reason for that is, you know, they're atoms that are really good at making covalent bonds. Hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon. Um, these, we'll see, you know, oxygen, of course, is part of water, that one most important chemical that we have in biology. Um, sulfur and nitrogen have lots of different possibilities in terms of bonding. And then, of course, carbon with its classic tetrahedral four potential bo bonds which it can make covalently. What are the bonds that are most common in biology? They're either hydroxyls, OHs. Sometimes you have acyl groups. They're a little less common with double bonds. Carbonyls. We also have carboxylic acids. This is actually really very common. We already saw this in what case? Carboxylic acids you see in last lecture. Of course, none of you are here on Monday, right? And amino acids and proteins. So yes, the carboxylic acid end. So very, very common. In proteins, we haven't talked about these yet, but we'll talk about them much more. Let's move on today. In proteins, sulfhydryl groups in the middle here on the left. Um, thiol groups, amino groups, of course, the opposite end of the protein and the individual amino acid. Phosphate groups that we already talked about in terms of our nucleic acids. Pyrophosphate, I mentioned really briefly. Pyrophosphate is if you cleave that alpha-beta bond in ATP as opposed to the beta-gamma bond first. You end up with two phosphorus with its associated oxygen atoms. Linkages, esters and ethers. We already talked about the esters, particularly a phosphodiester, which is what you have in all of your nucleic acid binding. Ethers, which you have in phospholipids. And then finally, we have amino bonds, also known as peptide bonds, is what you have in proteins. And I popped up this image here in the middle here basically to remind me that as soon as you have double bonds, that immediately gives you a lot of constraints in terms of how those atoms can rotate relative to each other. And it turns out that double bonds, particularly as we'll see for proteins in these peptide bonds over here, the bottom 
right is that's going to constrain how proteins can actually come together, what particular structure they're going to have, and of course the structure is what's going to give you the function. And so double bonds are really critical in terms of actually giving you these structures. So basic chemistry in terms of what happens with the individual bonds, what are the atoms that are involved. Let's talk about our favorite molecule here, which is water. Um, and why water is probably so critical as far as biology is concerned really has to do with the polarity. And now we're not talking about polarity like we have with nucleic acids, 5 prime to 3 prime or N terminus to C terminus. Now we're really talking about chemical polarity having to do with charge. And again, it just has to do with the electrons and the way that oxygen interacts with hydrogen when it makes covalent bonds with it. You end up with more electrons on one side of your molecule, less electrons on the other side of the molecule, and because of that, you have a slight charge. Stable charge, slightly negative, here shown at the top, and slightly positive down here at the bottom. As an example of a molecule which doesn't have chemical polarity to it, oxygen down here at the bottom, yes, there is negative out here and negative out here, but it's not a charge separation process. And so you don't have different charges on either end of the molecule. If you think about nucleic acids down here on the lower right-hand side, basically exactly the same thing is happening here. You end up with negative charge, a stable negative charge here on one of your oxygen groups on the outside and a stable positive charge on the phosphate in the middle. Um, and this is really a, an equilibrium between these two. We'll talk much more about equilibria as we move on through the rest of this. Why is this polarity so important? Well, basically it's because water can now interact with itself. All of these slightly negative parts of the molecule, particularly those hydrogen atoms, can now interact with the slightly negative part of that atom here with the oxygen. And so you form these really amazing molecular shells with the individual water molecules interacting with each other. And they do a really great job of interacting with each other. And hopefully, as we remember, there's huge amounts of water in all of our cells. So this is happening all the time. We've got all of these interactions happening between each other. A, it's important for water interactions, but of course, it's not just water which is present inside the cell. We also have a number of other atoms, et cetera, which are there. These are the now beginning to get to the weaker interactions. We talked about the covalent bonds. Again, these are the interactions between things which are sharing electrons. You can also have ionic interactions, which is where an electron actually gets completely moved from one atom to another, which is giving you a charged uh, particle here. Here we have the case of sodium chloride, probably the best understood of all of these ions. Usually, sodium is not present molecularly in non-charge. Chloride is not. However, they transfer electrons. You have a chloride ion and you have a sodium ion. These guys now can interact with each other, give nice salt crystals, which is normally what's going to happen, unless they're in a biological system. Biological system, of course, is mostly water. So now these are going to dissolve in such a way that you have the sodium ions, which have lost that electron, which now are interacting with the water, all of these partially negative pieces here, and of course the chloride ion in exactly a different way. So you have this caging which happens between the two. But this ionic interaction, the actual switching of an electron, but an ion can now separate from each other, unlike the covalent bonds where you're sharing, um, this gives you some interactions due to charge-charge interactions. These are our ionic interactions, which are part of those weak interactions. We're talking about molecular complementarity between the interactions. The second one of those, and probably the most you know, common, and certainly if we talk about nucleic acids, 
all about the hydrogen bonds. Anybody know came up with the concept of hydrogen bonds? Most famous scientist from Portland, probably? Linus Pauling was the first person to come up with the whole concept of hydrogen bonds. And basically, all that we have here is kind of what we were seeing already with the water interactions between the two. You've got a hydrogen atom, which is covalently bonded to one atom, but there's an electronegative, in particular in the case of water, this is a really nice electronegative oxygen here, which basically sort of pulls away a little bit at that hydrogen. And so you have these shared hydrogen interactions. This is a list of the most common ones that we have over here on the right-hand side. You shall have a donor, which is connected to the hydrogen. This is the one that has the classic covalent interaction, shared electrons, which are there. The hydrogen is going to be much closer to that particular atom. And then the acceptor, which is kind of trying to pull that hydrogen away. These interactions give you, you know, three to seven kilocalories per mole in terms of interactions between each other. Again, these hydrogen bonding interactions are classic defined with water. Here we've got the water-water interactions that we already talked about before, alcohol-water interactions with OHs that you have on your biological macromolecule that now interact with water, amines interact with water, peptides, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, everything's really interacting with water through hydrogen bond interactions. So water really is the hydrogen bonder as far as biological systems are concerned. So any questions up to this point? Again, hopefully this is all review for people. OK, next set of review has to do with acids and bases. This is not just trying to pull that hydrogen away. It is literally pulling that hydrogen away and putting it onto another molecule. And so in this case, it's just the case, once again, which is going on with water here. You have the normal hydrogen bonding interaction here on the left. And then that proton actually can move from this one water molecule to the other one, giving you a hydronium ion and a hydroxyl ion. And so this is the classic equilibrium it takes place. Again, we've got huge amounts of water which is around. You've got part of that water which has an extra hydrogen, part of it which doesn't. And this is in a pretty typical equilibrium. Critical as far as acid bases are concerned, of course, are the acids are the ones which pick up this hydrogen, and the bases are the ones that lose it. And here, you know, water, of course, is both, because we've got, you know, got hydrogen here being picked up and hydrogen here being lost. And we'll look at some more of the acids a little bit later on. So that's sort of an aside again, sort of a, a warm up in terms of thinking about some of the rest of these interactions. Another weak interactions, and this is an interesting kind of interaction because it actually serves as a positive interaction and a negative interaction in terms of how this actually works, the so-called van der Waals interactions. These are interactions between atoms that are involved in really close physical interactions between two different atoms or those atoms as being parts of different molecules. How does this happen? Well, it's because you have a charge in one of the atoms or molecules, another charge in one of the other atoms or molecules, which is pulling electrons around. And so these are the so-called induced dipoles. If you've got the dipole of water, that's a stable dipole. So that's not an induced dipole. Whereas here, these interactions of the molecules coming together will induce a dipole interaction. And because of that, you end up with these kinds of interactions. So up on the upper right-hand side here, you can see a graph of the energy versus the distance between the actual atoms that we're talking about here. And what you can see is at longer distances, there's basically no interaction whatsoever, no energy involved here. Whereas the, as you get closer, these two different molecules, shown here down here at the bottom, get closer and closer to each other, there's now an attractive force between the two until they get to a critical point, at which point you start to get really negative interactions because these things get too close to each other. 
And that's because of these, these dipole interactions, and they're going to be giving you charges. And so you get those charges too close to each other. It's not going to be attractive anymore. So they're attractive at a certain point, and then you get much, much less. So again, these are relatively short range. If you see the distance here, the separation for van der Waals interactions, this is now between the centers of the atoms, is around four, <coughs> excuse, angstroms, 10 to the minus 10. So it's really, really short interactions here. Uh, this is only about one kcal per mole, but if you see most interactions here down at the bottom are multiple van der Waals interactions, not just one. And so all of these are additive relative to each other. And this distance, by the way, right here is also known as the van der Waals radius. And if you see so-called space-filling models of molecules, it's almost always that van der Waals radius, which is the outside of that particular space-filling model that you're actually looking at. So van der Waals interactions, hydrogen bonding, and ionic interactions are really the three main interactions in terms of bond interactions, molecule interactions. Then there's also this thing called the hydrophobic, or hydrophobic bonds, hydrophobic interactions. I like to think of hydrophobic interactions as being a subset of hydrogen bonding, because it's really about the hydrogen bonding between water, which is giving you hydrophobic interactions. So if you think about hydrophobic molecules, and so here, a nonpolar substance, this is this orange piece right here, it's going to be in a biological system, it's an aqueous environment, there's going to be water that's associated with water around that molecule, but not associated with it. Because this doesn't have hydrogen bond donors and acceptors, no charges on the outside of that particular molecule. There's a second one of these around, same thing is going to be going on there. If these two now come together, you now have hydrogen bonds between all the water molecules on the outside, but most importantly, now you have fewer water molecules that have to be involved in these hydrogen bond interactions, can now go off and interact with other water. So this gives you an entropic driver, which allows you to have energy in this association here, where you have the two hydrophobic molecules which are coming together. So it's really about the water wanting to bind to itself, which sort of squishes, I like to think about it as squishing these two hydrophobic pieces together. So let's look at an overview now of these energies. As I mentioned before, if we look at covalent bonds, particularly carbon-carbon covalent bonds, or double bonds between carbons over here on the far right-hand side, these are very strong in terms of these interactions between each other. It takes a lot of energy to make these bonds. It takes a lot of energy to break these bonds. On the other hand, the high energy ATP bonds are about here in the middle. This is, by the way, a log scale at the bottom here. So these are way out here. Um, and then almost all of the biological interactions over here on the left-hand side, these non-covalent interactions, van der Waals interactions, hydrogen bonds, ionic interactions, so you need a whole bunch of these to actually correspond to the energy that you get here. But because of all these weak interactions and them being very close to the standard thermal energy at 37 degrees C, which is what most of us are functioning at, um, other than my organisms in the lab, they like 80 degrees C, so their thermal energy is further over here. Uh, but for us, all of these interactions are very similar to thermal energy, so it allows you a lot of flexibility. And flexibility sort of kind of defines biology. If it's a solid, it's not really going to be um, biology. So any questions on the bonds? Yeah? What are the ionic bonds? Yeah, well, so they didn't put, so the question is, what, where are the ionic bonds on here? Um, they're not labeled in this particular case. And the reason, I think, for that, I didn't write the textbook. <laughs> um, but they're, they're in here, um, for the most part, in terms of aqueous systems. If you talk about non-aqueous systems, they can be way over here. And so I think that's the reason they didn't actually put them on here. But in terms of aqueous systems, what we're going to be looking at, they're down here, um, certainly in terms of these weak interactions relative to the covalent interactions which you're going to have. Any other questions on this? OK, so let's move a little bit more into acids and bases, equilibrium, chemical reactions, et cetera. 
already talked about this. I showed you the slide down here at the bottom, the protons moving around in water. But this is true, of course, for all acids. Acids like acetic acid can lose a hydrogen. Water then is going to pick it up. So we've got acids, which can then lose hydrogen. So that's the whole idea. And of course, bases are those that they can pick up a, a hydrogen. <clears throat> so we'll see more acids and bases. And particularly important for acids and bases are the amino acid side chains. There are four different amino acid side chains which can either pick up or lose hydrogens. And because of that, at physio under physiological conditions, i.e., what most of us are functioning in, they're going to have stable charges relative to each other. And this turns out to be really critical in terms of all of the biological chemistry which is going on here. Quick aside, chemistry-wise, I'm not going to ask you really detailed questions on this. Uh, nucleophiles versus electrophiles, almost all of the biochemical reactions have to do with either things that are <clears throat> getting rid of electrons or things that are picking up electrons. And so it's what also a lot of people talk about pushing electrons is one of the main processes you talk about in terms of biochemistries. Which electrons go where? And again, these are some of those classic atoms that we've already talked about before. We've got <clears throat> atoms that are in oxygen, what's it? Oxygen, which can give up electrons. We've got these <clears throat> C double bond O's, which can then pick up electrons. And as we see, we'll see, and when we look at some of the protein structures, particularly for a lot of the enzymes, these are going to be those atoms which you're going to find doing the actual chemistry. And so, as far as chemistry is concerned, it's really going to be about the nucleophiles and the electrophiles. And we'll look at those in much more detail again as we move along through the rest of the, the class here. What are doing most of those things, particularly in enzymes, they're the amino acids. Last time we talked about amino acids with a little R hanging off of the side. What are those R's in the vast majority of cases? They're one of these 20 R groups, amino acid side chains. But these guys, just like those molecules talked about right at the beginning, are either going to be hydrophobic, hydrophilic, or a couple of bizarre weird cases down here at the bottom. I don't expect you to remember all of these amino acids. Don't worry. You can take biochemistry if you want to do that. Uh, but <clears throat> importantly is that we really have these two or maybe three different classes of amino acids. So all of them have our normal carboxyl group, an amino group attached to them, and then the side chains are what's different. You can either have relatively small side chains, like the alanine, which you have here, which just has a methyl group on it, or very large side chains, such as the phenylalanine ring, which you have on the outside here. So all of these guys are hydrophobic, again, meaning that water interactions are going to try and push these guys together. You also have hydrophilic amino acids, and we're going to talk much more about some of these basic and acidic ones in just a second, but you've got these which can be stably charged, but also lots of them that will have either alcohol groups or sulfhydryl groups that are present on the outside, which are interacting with water, and so these are going to be the parts of proteins which is going to be exposed to water. They'll be in the outside of the protein. And these are the things which are going to be interacting with other molecules which are probably not going to be as hydrophobic. These special amino acids down here at the bottom, a couple of things I wanted to talk about. One, cysteine, as we'll see. Cysteine is really interesting because what it does, it can form covalent bonds between different amino acid side chains. And we'll see that's the sulfhydryl bond which forms here. Glycine, you could almost just as easily put up here at the top in terms of the hydrophobic amino acids because it just has a hydrogen atom which is present here. 
But glycine, because it only has this really small side chain, again, the hydrogen atom is really small, um, this allows you huge amounts of flexibility in terms of your protein and your protein side chains. And so this particular amino acid you're going to find in really flexible parts of proteins. Then the last one, which is sort of the opposite of that, is proline, because proline's side chain actually loops back around and hooks up to the amino group which is present in your normal amino acid backbone which you have up here at the top. So this really constrains the flexibility of whatever polypeptide you have that has that particular residue which is actually in it. So. So, already talked about the sulfhydryls, which is over here on the right-hand side. If you've got two cysteines in usually different parts, or different parts of the sequence of either one protein, it can even be multiple different proteins, under reducing conditions, you can get these two, uh, sorry, not under reducing conditions, under oxidizing conditions, excuse me, um, you can get formation of a covalent bond between these two sulfur atoms, and that will be holding two separate pieces of your protein together with these covalent bonds. Another one to talk about here is the histidine side chain. And the histidine side chain, again, our amino acids up here at the top, what our amino and carboxy terminal ends, this is our side chain, here has a nitrogen atom that in some cases, around about pH 5.8, is positively charged, but at 7.8 is neutral. And so here, of course, this is going to be a very hydrophilic. This will be quite hydrophobic. Here, we can actually have this positive charge that's actually now potentially available to pick up electrons. So what's that going to be? Is it a nucleophile, electrophile? Electrophile. Um, and that, as we'll see, is true in many, many cases for many enzymes. In fact, the histidine, which is serving as an electrophile in many enzymatic reactions. pH 5.8 is quite close to the normal situation inside the cell, which is around pH 7, pH 7.2. Um, and so depending on what other proteins and other water is around this particular side chain, this can bounce back and forth quite a bit. And so this is a really nice way of having flexibility in terms of what kinds of reactivity, et cetera, you're going to have chemically at any particular point. So here with our histidine side chain, this can bounce back and forth. On the other hand, for the vast majority of the time, for basic or acidic amino acids, and these are going to be the basic lysine and arginine, acidic glutamate and aspartate, or glutamic acid, or aspartic acid. Um, I've just put the single letter code here because I'm lazy. Um, and you'll often see this in the biological literature. I don't expect you to know it, but I do find it's actually really quite useful. So we look up here at the example of E, which is glutamate. Here's the side chain in its carboxylic acid form. Here's now in the charge form. Most of the time, this is now going to be charged at a neutral pH, i.e., inside the cell. On the other hand, lysines and arginines almost always are in the protonated state, and so they have a stable positive charge. And what have we talked about that has a stable negative charge most of the time? Any, any kind of acidic and the really most important acids that we talk about in terms of molecular biology? Is it going to be our nucleic acids? So, positively charged things like to interact with negatively charged things. So, almost always, if you're talking about nucleic acid protein interactions, these basic amino acids are going to be involved in that whole process. And these will come up again and again and again as we move throughout the rest of the course. So we've got our 
acid bases, and this is kind of why I wanted to go through acids and bases to start with here, um, and when we also have these um, different amino acid side chains. But as if that wasn't confusing enough, it turns out that almost all proteins and almost all amino acids can be modified chemically in some way above and beyond just this transfer of protons, et cetera. So these are just a few of the examples here of et cetera, dot, 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 dot. I think there are about 200 different chemical modifications that are known to happen in proteins. This particular case, probably the most important that we're going to talk about for the rest of this course is this phosphorylation, which takes place on alcohol side chains, those alcohol side chains that we're going to be interested in for this course are going to be serine, threonine, and tyrosine, also very important for cell biology. So you have this phosphorylation event. Phosphorylation is really nice because it gives you a large change, both in terms of your charge, but also in terms of the shape and size of your molecule at that one particular position. So phosphorylation gives you a big change in your structure, which of course is also going to give you a big change in your function. So we'll talk a lot more about phosphorylation as we move along, but we have methylation that happens, particularly on histidines. We're going to have acetylation, which happens like we have up here at the top, very often on lysines. So you have multiple different changes in terms of what can happen above and beyond those 20 different amino acids, of course, which is going to lead to slightly different functions for each of these guys. So let's finish up talking a little bit about the nucleic acids. This is exactly the same slide that I showed you before. Again, we've got a 3' prime end. We've got a 5' prime end. Each of the individual nucleotides comes together to make you a polymer through these phosphodiester bonds. Now let's look a little bit more detail at these bases, which are present here at the top. And again, what does base mean? Can give up. Yes, exactly. And then the um, acids, can they be picking up these, these hydrogens? So <clears throat> here are ribose. This is not DNA. So we can actually have our OH down here at the bottom here. Uh, OH at the bottom here is our ribose. You also have two prime deoxyribose. Um, I should mention here the prime numberings. Uh, primes are then relative to all of the atoms which you have, the carbon atoms present on your sugar. So we've got a one prime carbon, two prime carbon, three prime carbon, four prime carbon, five prime carbon. So we talk about five prime to three prime. That's the molecular biology polarity that you have in one part of your molecule. Then the bases are numbered without primes. So 1 through 9 in the case of adenine, etc. So that's the difference between the two. We're not going to talk too much about these individual positions, although modified bases, a lot of times people talk about 8-oxoguanine. That will tell you that it's actually modification at the 8th position here in that ring structure. What are the bases? five standard bases which are used in molecular biology. Um, lots of other nucleotides which are out there, so this is by no means the only ones, but these are the ones are which we use. Adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine in DNA. Uracil, which is basically missing this methyl group in thymine, which we have in RNA. Um, Particularly, we mentioned before, uracil is a little bit more flexible in terms of the structures that it can be picking up. So RNA can give you a few more different structures. Thymine, as it turns out, is probably much more stable, and particularly in terms of DNA repair. And we'll get back and talk to much more about that later on. Two flavors of these bases, purines and pyrimidines. The way I like to remember these, purines, short name, Big molecule, pyrimidines, long name, small molecule. And hopefully all of you know, how do you get double-stranded things that form? Because always have purines that are pairing with pyrimidines. So, um, but yeah, I don't expect you to remember all of these structures 
per se. So that clock is actually just about right. And I think we'll actually stop here and talk about reactions and all the chemistry, thermodynamics, and <clears throat> the kinetics um, on Friday.